invite you to please stand as we speak together the gospel acclamation. We are turning, Lord, to hear you. You are merciful and kind, slow to anger, rich in blessing, and with love to us inclined. The Holy Gospel comes to us today from the Gospel of St. John, the 20th chapter. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Christ. Please be seated. So you may or may not have known before you came in today that this was Synod Assembly Weekend for the Lower Susquehanna Synod. We hold it every year at Messiah College, first Friday and Saturday of June. And this weekend we heard some sobering statistics about the Lutheran Church. The Lutheran Church is shrinking in North America. And it's exploding in places like Liberia and Tanzania. In fact, it appears that our country is becoming less religious, while other parts of the world are just discovering what Martin Luther was talking about 500 years ago. Justification by faith through grace, that we are justified by faith in a loving God who gave us a gift through Jesus Christ. Therefore, as worshiping Lutherans, the light, the acts, the teachings of Jesus that we learned about and we remember from our confirmation days, well, most likely, your neighbor has never heard. And in fact, if we do not begin to figure out how to get this message of justification by faith, through God's grace, out to our neighbors. Well, by the year 2025, the Lutheran Church will be entering skilled nursing care like the majority of those who sit in the pews right now across this country. Now, those aren't necessarily the words that you hope to hear this morning, this being Pentecost Sunday, a a day that we are familiar with the text. The reading E did so well. Everyone lives in dread of having to read on the day of Pentecost. We heard about the violent wind. We heard about how the entire house was suddenly filled with that wind. That room where the disciples were hiding out. And if that wasn't scary enough, Tongues of fire came and settled on each one of the disciples, and then to get even more crazy, they began to speak in different languages. So that all the visitors in Jerusalem understood, heard in their own language. We have heard this story. But that doesn't mean we can get the image in our minds or really wrap our heads around that story. Well, we have heard it described as the days the disciple or the day the disciples received the Holy Spirit. So the story is less about the disciples, really, than it is about the giving of the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit. The people who were there, the, the ones who were not disciples, wanted to know what was going on. So they began to murmur among each other and to make accusations. You know, if there would have been a reporter standing there at that moment, he would have, the reporter would have turned to Peter and said, Peter, what the heck is going on? Peter, the one who's not so well-spoken, the one who is 
sort of impetuous and things just kind of jump out of his mouth, Peter demonstrated the classic pivot. Do you know what a pivot is? And I'm not talking about the pivot foot in basketball. The pivot is a move that a politician or a person makes when they are asked a question by a reporter. Politicians get up on a particular day and their handler or whoever is working with them will give them the message of the day. This is the message we need to get out today. They might say, today your message is to talk about how awful the Republican health care bill is. So they go on their way, knowing what their message is, and then a reporter stands up and they say, do you have a comment about the, uh, the explosion at the Ariana Grande concert or the, or the incident last night on the London Bridge? And the politician says, well, yeah, that was really awful, but not as awful as the Republican, the Republican health care bill. And they go on and on and on about the Republican health care bill, and they never answer the question. But they were asked. That's a pivot. Are you with me? All right. Seems to me that's what Peter does in the story from Acts and the giving of the Holy Spirit. The people stand up and say, hey, Peter, are all of those guys drunk? Peter says, no, they're not drunk. And then he pivots. This is what the prophet Joel prophesied so many years ago in the last days. God declared I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, and the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood. Can you imagine the people standing around saying, what does that have to do with this? The people think the disciples are filled with spirits of some kind, and Peter is telling them in a not so direct way that no, it's the Holy Spirit. Spirit, and this is something that the people wouldn't even have understood. Peter does the pivot from, no, they're not drunk, to they're drunk with the Holy Spirit. Do you ever wonder why alcohol was called spirits to begin with? You know, you go to the wine and spirits store. Do you ever wonder? I did. I found three explanations. I don't know if they're any good or not. One is that when you drink alcohol, it lifts your spirits. So they call them spirits. I don't like that one because I know too many mean drunks in my life. Uh, another, a second one was the word alcohol comes from the Arabic word al-kahul. It's a very fine powder substance. It's SB2S3 if you want to know your chemical compound. It's used uh, in antiseptics. It's used for eyeliner. It's used in a, dis it, it's made through a, dis a distillation process. And so that word al-kahul became synonymous with distillation. And so you can see where al-kahul, alcohol, you with me? Yeah? Okay. The other explanation was the word alcohol actually comes from the Arabic word for ghoul, which is al-ghoul, which also means spirit or demon. So, whichever one of those three you like, you can pick. So we have the word alcohol comes from words that sound like spirit or, or mean something similar to it. It's no surprise that over the years we've heard People describe when they are seen at a Pentecostal meeting or a tent revival, people say, boy, they look like they're drunk with the Spirit, right? So maybe we can understand why Peter pivots. He doesn't want people to think that they're drunk. No one likes being accused of drinking, not Tiger Woods, not Kathy Griffin. I hope you've been following the news, then you understand my jokes, but probably not. But having that implication of being drunk with the Spirit sort of gives the edge to what the Holy Spirit really is about because the Holy Spirit is a dangerous thing, my friends. There are different terms for the Holy Spirit in the Gospels. 
The Holy Spirit is called the Comforter. The Holy Spirit is called the Advocate. The Holy Spirit is called the Paraclete. And those are comforting thoughts. Oh, the Holy Spirit comes to comfort us, and it does. And the Holy Spirit comes to advise us, and it does. When we call it the paraclete, it sounds like a parakeet, oh, that cute little bird. The Holy Spirit can do those things, comfort us, and guide us, and advise us. It reminds us that Jesus is with us in times of trouble. But while the Holy Spirit will come to guide and to lead the disciples in the days and the months to come, they're not riding off to the sunset to retire in peaceful lives, are they? Each one will be persecuted and imprisoned and run into conflict and danger and roadblocks and will be put to death. Even in the description of the day of Pentecost, we don't have really a comforting vision, do we? There's the sound of something that sounds like a violent wind. When there's a violent wind around my house, the siding shakes. All of the things around the house are being blown around outside. The trees are rubbing together violently. There's nothing comforting about a violent wind. And when a fire just imagine the person next to you and a fire settles upon their head. I don't think you're going to sit there and say, oh, isn't that nice? I remember in third grade, on our birthdays, our teacher would give you a cupcake with a candle, a lit candle on it. And one day, the person with the lit candle and the cupcake, there was a girl sitting in front who had long hair. And she leaned back, and what happened? Her hair caught on fire. The teacher didn't say, oh, isn't that nuts? So there's nothing comforting about fire settling upon us. And then they started to talk in different languages. And the people, it was, it was described as they were bewildered. And they were amazed. And they were perplexed. In other words, they were scared out of their minds. They didn't understand. And then Peter begins to tell them, this is what the prophet Joel said, just wait, the moon's going to turn to blood, and the sun's going to go dark, and things are going to rain out of the sky. And to top that, you killed the author of life who has come back from the dead. So yes, the Holy Spirit is a comforter. And yes, the Holy Spirit is an advocate, and it's a sure guide. The Holy Spirit is the manner that God speaks to you and me and the church in these days. And when we are connected with the Holy Spirit, we do feel a real sense of joy and happiness. But the Holy Spirit will also guide us into actions that we are not comfortable with, and will take us into places that take us out of our comfort zone. And here's where we need to take some time to listen and to pray in the days and the weeks and the months to come. Any kind, anytime there is a change, like the day of Pentecost was such a change for the disciples. Anytime there is a change, there is anxiety. There is uncertainty. There is disagreement. The apostles will enjoy some time of togetherness, but soon they will be disagreeing with one another to the point that they finally decide we need to just break apart and go. There will be disagreements about who takes care of the widows. There will be disagreements about how and who we welcome people into the church. Now we gather today in a congregational meeting to talk about this change of worship. The time for the change of worship in the fall. And when are we going to have faith formation? And what will this mean for this church? It's a time of excitement. It's a time of anxiety. It's why we need to invite the Holy Spirit to be a part of our discussions all through the summer. The Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us and comforts us, but also provokes us and sustains us and challenges us. 
Without the Holy Spirit, my friends, we are a people afloat without a GPS. God's pneuma system. Pneuma is a word for spirit. I forgot to tell you. Three words in the Bible for the word spirit. The Hebrew word is ruach. The ruach. It says at the beginning of Genesis, God's spirit hovered over the formless void. That's the ruach. The Latin word is spiritus. The Greek word is pneuma. Like a pneumatic tire. God's pneuma system. If we do not have the spirit guiding us, we are a people lost in Perry County. Sorry for those of you raised in Perry County. I do not mean to offend Andrew. Good. My first church was in Perry County. I got lost plenty of time. So the hardest news that we need to hear today isn't necessarily about how the Lutheran Church is struggling across North America, although that is troubling to hear. The hardest words we may we hear today is that the Holy Spirit doesn't necessarily come to solve our problems, nor does it prevent disagreements from happening. As we know how the lives of the disciples ended, they were all martyred for their faith. Yet they had great opportunities to see God active in their lives and in their ministry. We need to live lives where we expect the Spirit to come into our lives and to be open to the unpredictable experience of that Spirit. But we can't pivot away from it when it comes. We need to pivot into the Spirit. We need to pivot into the call of the Spirit, even if it takes us to uncomfortable places. We may find we go on some of the most exciting adventures of sharing and inviting and giving and participating and renewing and reforming and revisioning of our faith. My friends, expect the Holy Spirit, of course, you can't predict when it's going to come and where it's going to take you. Prepare for the Holy Spirit, but how can you prepare for something that you don't know when to expect it? Love the Holy Spirit when it comes into your life because, no, it's not going to solve your problems, but it will take you and make your life that much more exciting. And unpredictable. It will change you. It will surprise you. It will scare you. But my friends, it's God's presence among us. It will take us on a journey of a lifetime. Eternal life. Amen. Amen.
I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. 